this is a long psalm. We were due to, to Psalm 69 and Isaiah um, 28, but I didn't put both of them on the list because this is a long psalm. We may not get through it, but the Lord knows and the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us. But I feel it's such an appropriate psalm <laughs> for the season that we're in. Um, praise the Lord, how he, how he, his perfect timing and guidance works with these things. Um, so this is um, Psalm 69, it's to the chief musician set to the lilies, a psalm of David. So oftentimes these psalms would have been sung. Um, and so this is um, a, a song that was set to this song called the lilies, which we knew what the lilies was. That'd be lovely to actually hear it. Uh, maybe, maybe there are, there are Hebrew you know, priests and Levites who, and singers who, who actually know what that yes. is. You know? yes. um, I don't know enough about that stuff, uh, but that would be amazing um, to actually hear in Hebrew, this song, you know, to the song that David said it to. Um, but anyway, um, this is um, a psalm of, of, of David, the great psalms. Um, and as we know, David is a type of Christ. Okay, he's a, he's a, he has a heart after the Lord's heart. Um, he is a man after the Lord's own heart. And um, he is a type of Christ. So he is one who frequently prophesied about Jesus through his psalms. Um, about the, about what you would undergo about things that were, um, you know, key points in Jesus's life. Um, but he also is a type of Christ. He, he's a picture of, you know, just that, um, you know, being, you know, reviled for the sake of the Lord, you know, as Jesus was. And as Jesus says, we will be. And he says that when we are reviled for, reviled for his name's sake, that we are blessed, that we are blessed. It's powerful stuff. You know, it's easy to, it's easy to read this stuff and just think, well, you know, yeah, that's, 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 isn't that neat, that's nice. But then when the real reviling starts to come, when the real trials start to come, you know, we have to be, we have to be, we have to, we have to allow our faith to be tested and to be shown to be real. We have to allow it because it's like all the stuff we've been reading about and, 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 and praying about and preaching about with respect to the end times and the coming of the king and, and the establishment of his kingdom but the time leading up to that and what it's going to look like. And then I fear that the church, you know, can be like, well, here it is. And it's like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, what are you doing, you know? Um, and, and it's like that song was seen, awake, awake my soul, you know, arise. This is the time for the church to arise. And by that, I mean whatever the Holy Spirit is, is speaking to you about. But obviously what it means spiritually to arise is to, is to be, you know, stepping up and into greater things, greater faith, greater, you know, uh, greater risks, okay? And again, I'm not necessarily talking about you know because like you know risking maybe in the way that we're risking and having this this meeting here right now or risking in the way that we're you know going out in the street and preaching and stuff like that I, that's one way of, of risking but there's all kinds of risks okay it, but it's speaking the truth when everybody else is saying something else as the lord leads it's you know it's 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 holding fast to what we have, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and if the, the Spirit's been speaking in, in, in the, throughout the, the run-up to, to, to a great time of trial, um, then it's like staying true with what, that's, what the Spirit had been speaking, that thing that the Spirit had been speaking, staying true to it and, 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 and holding fast to it. Um, and, and stepping out in that way, in belief, in wild, wild prayers of belief, and believing for these mighty, mighty things um, to happen, that, that they must happen as we pray in the name of Jesus, united together, um, you know, and, and, and as we, we pray in accordance with his word and his spirit and his truth, um, then, you know, we're believing that these things are done, we believe that you have what are the conditions for that again? Jesus says, you gather together two or three in my name and I am there. And, and when you do that, if you pray in my name believe and believe the things that you pray, you will have them. You will have them. So it's all about unity. It's about, 
um, togetherness, whether togetherness is online togetherness or physical togetherness, um, it, 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 and it's about believing radically um, that he wants to lavishly, you know, do things um, so that he'll be glorified. Um, and 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 you know, all these things are just craziness to the world, um, and we will be reviled for the world. Okay, um, but. Jesus says, blessed are you when that happens. So it is a type of that. So we're going to be seeing that in this psalm as, as we go through. So let's start. Um, psalm 69, verse 1. And I just love the place that David's in. <laughs> it's not a good place to be in one sense, but in another sense, it's the best place to be. <laughs> Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my, my Bible says neck, but literally the word there means soul. The waters have come up to my soul. In other words, my very life is getting drowned out by these waters, by these storm waters. Save me, O oh God. Um, the waters have come up to my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. Okay. He can't even stand up. He's completely sunk down in deep mire. I've got a great picture um, when we did an earlier psalm, like about a year ago where it talked about, you know, being in the mire, the miry clay. Um, and I can't remember what soul it was, but I, I had this great picture. I put it up. It's somewhere on the computer, actually. Um, but it's a picture of this of this guy, this, this this soldier that's going through this really harsh train. It's actually the same train that I went through when I was in the, the military. Um, and it's, it's this train that just tries to destroy you, you know, just destroy you. you destroy your, mor your morale, destroy your, um, your, your will to go on you know, through, you know, physical, you know, hardship. Um, and, and all you have to do to get, to get relief is to say, I quit. That's all you have to do. Um, and so, um, but this picture is this guy, he's completely in mud, completely in mud. And the mud's like up to here on him and his whole face. And all you can see is, is just a little bit of his mouth right here. And his two eyes open. The rest is all pure mud. He's just sat there like this in utter misery. Um, and and it's such a poignant picture because that that's what this is like spiritually. That physical thing is like what it what this feels like spiritually. So why did I say it was a good place to be? It's a horrible place to be. In, but guess what? Guess what? It's our Father's mercy to allow us to be in that place because that is the place where we find Him. That is the place where. where he does the refining. That is the place where he does the equipping. That is the place where he makes himself real to us. And it's the place where he shows himself strong on our behalf. And so I encourage everybody to, to the thing is, if we, humble, if we humble ourselves voluntarily, we can, be, we, can, we can get all that stuff every day without having to be in such a horrible place. But so often we don't. So often we get puffed up, we get, um, we, get um, we, we go on autopilot and we just go through motions because we've learned how to do this over a number of years, how to do church, how to do your walk. And so you get on these kind of autopilot modes and, and, and you don't even realize that it's, the, it's, not the, it's no longer the spirit leading, it's the flesh leading. Um, and, and Jesus loves us and he's merciful and he, wants, he, he knows that's no place for his his precious sons and daughters to be in it. So he allows these place types to come where we just have to then cry out, I'm poor and needy, I'm weak and pathetic, I'm stuck, I'm in the mud, I am, you know, trampled, I am overwhelmed with everything, my circumstances, everything that's going on. And when we do, when we're in that place, he always gives us how he always comes and rescues us. But how much better, <laughs> how much better if, um, we are doing that every day, coming in that place of absolute humility, of childlikeness, childlikeness. That place where you just you just know you're rubbish. You just know that you're useless without his supernatural power poured out within you. Um, and then what does he do? He pours it out. <laughs> he pours it out every day. And and then and then you know. You're the most amazed person on earth that, you know, that he uses you in the way that he uses you because we know it's all his power. It's all him. 
So it's a good place to be in. It's not a place that we desire to be in. It's not a place that you'd want to be in because that would be fanatical and weird. But it's a place that you agree with him. Okay, Lord, you allow me to get into this place, okay, um, for a reason. And so I'm going to agree with your purposes. Never agreeing with the enemy and, and, and the whip that God uses because he uses the enemy as a whip. That's actually a scripture. He uses the enemy. And I can't remember the exact word I'm paraphrasing. But he uses the enemy as a whip, okay? Um, but then the enemy thinks that he's in control and he gets to do all this stuff and then God oh, crushes him. Um, that's what he does. So, I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail. Why I wait for my God. Remember, waiting for God doesn't mean necessarily a time of inaction. What waiting means is trusting in faith. That's what in the Old Testament, when it always talks about wait upon the Lord, it's trusting in faith. Okay? Um, you know, it's like, and the way that we know that it's not just inaction is because in the same passage in, um, is it Habakkuk? I think it's the book of Habakkuk. Um, though the vision tarry, is that Habakkuk or Nahum? Um, Habakkuk. I think it's Habakkuk. Yeah. Um, yeah. Though the vision tarry, it says, wait for it. And then it goes on to say, run with the vision. Okay. And you're like, well, how do I run and wait at the same time? And the answer is, you run in faith, <laughs> trusting no matter what, then that, that vision has to come. The fulfillment of the vision has to come okay so take for example the vision of the revival of the peninsula okay it you know if, if that is of god okay and his people believe it and declare it, it has to come it simply has to and so we run with that vision okay <laughs> as he leads as this wind of the spirit blows we run with that vision even though Year after year after year, we do not see. That is waiting. <laughs> that is saying, though the vision tarries, I am trusting in the Lord to fulfill the vision, and I am running with it until he does. So too, guys, with the vision of the destruction of this hairy crowned enemy. Okay? <laughs> this, this coronavirus is an enemy of the Lord. It is an enemy of the Lord. He is allowing it for this time. And he's going to use this enemy to, to, to bring his purposes around. But he is so ready to crush it on behalf of his spirit-filled, faith-filled, trample, you know, enemy scorpion trampling church. He is so ready to do that. And so every day as I've been preaching, we should be declaring this is the day. Coronavirus, you very crowned enemy of the Lord, that you are fleeing this land, you land, you are trampled in the name of Jesus Christ. This is the day that you flee this land completely. Okay? And as we declare that, we, that's running with that vision. Okay? But at, until we see it, continuing on running with it is waiting for the vision to fulfill, even though it tarries. Okay? So this is true for whatever comes next as well, guys, because as I keep saying, this is just the beginning of the birth pangs. There's going to be other birth pangs as well. And uh, while I don't believe that for the actual, sticking with that metaphor of the birth pangs, for the actual, you know, final bam, uh, the birth, as it were, um, you know, uh, of the fullness of the tribulation, we're not going to be there. I believe that with all my heart as we if we're watching and waiting, guys, if we're, if, if we're running with the vision, <laughs> even though it tarries, um, if we're waiting, um, uh, you know, trusting uh, in the Lord, um, uh, you know, for the fulfillment of the vision, as we're doing that, we can't help but be looking at Jesus, because there's no way we could be doing those things if we're not looking at Jesus. And as we're looking at Jesus, we're ready. That's us ready, because we're looking, and here he comes, like a flash of lightning, and his church is off with him. So that's what's going to happen. So 
we're just going to be here for the birth pangs is my belief. Now, guys, I submit that to you. Okay, I'm just a man. I could be wrong. There's lots of different, there's so many different, you know, prophetic passages, and it's, it's very difficult to know for sure. So I don't declare that dogmatically. But what I do declare is that is my sincere belief and reading, and I humbly submit that to you. I submit it to the Lord all the time for him to correct me if that's wrong. But the point is, guys, um, we are, we are going to be here for the birth banks. So the birth banks are going to be, you know, they're going to be wild enough, okay? Um, but we, as we run, as we wait, as we do as he calls us, we're going to see these things. Um, these, these fulfillments of these visions. Um, so, um, I am weary with my crying, my throat is dry, my eyes fail while I wait for my God. Okay, so David is a place where he's waiting, he's trusting in God, okay? But in the meantime, he's really in a bad way. We can all get to this place, guys. Okay, but we're going to see throughout this psalm that we're going to see throughout this psalm that Although we can all be in the exact same place that David is in, I believe we have something that David didn't have. David, you know, there are times when, because, you know, David has prophetic um, glimpses of the new covenant, okay, such as in Psalm 51, where he says, um, you know, burnt offerings and sacrifices you do not, you do not delight in, but a broken and contrite spirit, you know. That's so speaking of the new covenant. That's the thing that washes us and cleanses us, the blood of Jesus, as we repent, as we are broken before our Lord. So things like that, um, you know, um, there are glim prophetic glimpses of the new covenant, but David doesn't. There's no way he has the fullness of it. He can't. It's not, it's not spiritually possible because the blood of Christ has not yet been shed, okay? We, and, and the Pentecost has not yet come. Prior to Pentecost, guys, and, and, and throughout the Old Testament, whenever people were moved by the Spirit, it was a, it was a, it was a unique thing every time. It was a unique thing when a prophet would speak according to the utterances of the Holy Spirit, when you know the writing of the of, of, of the Holy Scriptures. Um, these kinds of things were like, okay, here you go. Um, this is this is a prophetic, and this is a, a, a Holy Spirit anointing. Okay. But it's not something you walk and live in daily, okay? We have something that everybody who predates Christ could never have. This is what Jesus said of John the Baptist, that he was the greatest of all the prophets that have ever come. But he is least um, in the kingdom of heaven. So I can't, you remember, you remember the verse, it's in John. I can't remember exactly how it says, but... Though that he's the greatest of all the prophets, John the Baptist was, he's the least. Why? Because he didn't walk and move in the, 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 the Pentecostal times. <laughs> and so um, that is why we get something that none of these amazing, amazing heroes of the faith ever had. And that means that I believe this with all my heart, guys, that even though we get to play the place where David is in this, we can get out of it much more quickly than oftentimes David does. Because we get to that place of brokenness, of absolute recognition of our neediness, of our sin, a, a, a absolute place of, of, of broken spirit, a contrite heart. And we cry out and we run through the blood of Jesus to the throne of grace with boldness, you see. And he does what he does, that grace for time, for, for strength and, and, and grace and time with me. And he does it. Bam, bam, bam. And he lifts us up. Okay. And whether it's because of our sin or because, you know, our partnerships with the enemy or because of our, you know, uh, being consumed with the cares of the world and our, our lack of being filled with the spirit or whether it's because it's just been a refining process. He had to take us into the miry pit for, for greater refining. For, for more glory, for more eternal weight of glory than we would have had otherwise. Even if it's not because we've been wrong at all in terms of our walk or whatever. All those things are possibilities. And he brings us to that place. But as soon, guys, as soon as we have the realization 
and we just, you know, receive in faith on the basis of the blood of Jesus, bam, we are restored. Our strength, our peace, our healing, our rescue, our deliverance, these things can be so, so quick now in ways that these guys are. And do you realize, do you guys realize what we have? I mean, it blows the mind. <gasps> Many are last who will be first. Guys, what we have because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And even more, as I've preached before, because we are, you know, operating in this time, living in this time. This time that is the, 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 the consummation of all things, okay? These end times, we have the fullness of the, the revelation, um, you know, in ways that I believe the church over the last couple thousand years didn't always have, okay? Um, in other words, the scriptures come to life in ways that I believe were closed off to people in earlier times because it wasn't that... that, that, that interpretation it wasn't ready the church wasn't ready to receive that because the time wasn't right the season wasn't right okay this is why some people will say that the whole rapture the whole doctrine of the rapture and the jesus coming and taking this church up um you know and, and, and whether you think it's you know pre-trib or mid-trib or, or post-trib that whole doctrine um is 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 a new invention. It came out in the 1850s, um, and it was actually the precursors of the Brethren that, that actually came up with that, with, with, which first um, expressed that doctrine. And so, on that basis, people will actually say, "Well, you know, obviously, this is the, you know, God would have revealed that to, to all the great church fathers and all the great people that came before. So, obviously, we shouldn't believe it." But that's that's bad. That's that's not how the Lord works. He opens up levels of interpretation, okay? He seals things until the time is right. <laughs> he seals them and then he opens them up to his church through his spirit for the church that needs it at that time. And he's preparing this. He's been preparing his church since the middle of the 19th century for this return, okay? And he's been stirring us up. Um, and that's been passed on down the way. And they needed to get it too so that they could declare it in a way that would stir us up. Smithy, Smith Wigglesworth is so, his, his declarations and teachings of the rapture are so powerful, okay? And he was, he was just, that doctrine was just a new doctrine in a sense when he was putting it forth. And he'd been taught it by a brethren guy. Um, and, and, but that was necessary for us. So that we, the church that's in the end times, could receive that, that teaching from Smithy. I mean, it's powerful how God brings all these things together. So we have something in these times, guys. It's amazing and it's powerful. It's the blood of Jesus, which the people, everybody before, you know, um, Jesus' cross didn't have for, 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 for the healing and, and for the deliverance. It's the power of the Spirit. It's the outpouring of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, which nobody had. In, in, in the fullness until Pentecost. Okay. And we just need to be understanding what this amazing gift is, what this amazing, what this amazing, amazing, precious, precious gift of the Holy Spirit is. And how dare we, you know, not, you know, press in, you know, for, for the fullness of it. Because he's, done everything for us to be able to walk in this, um, in the, the fullness. All of us, I don't care who you are, to walk in the fullness of the gifts of the Spirit. Desire the best gifts, <laughs> Paul says. Do we desire the best gifts or do we just go, oh, that's for those special people or those people in leadership, you know, and, and you know, I don't really want to, you know, be put on the spot anyway. And, and so, no, desire the best gifts, and then you will be one of those who, though you're last, you will be first. <laughs> As we desire this, don't make it, it's not being puffed up, it's not being prideful, you know, to desire the best gifts. The scripture says to desire it. So don't say things like, oh, 
I'm too, you know, I could never have that or I could never do that because that's actually false humility. And that's telling the Lord, he can't do that. He can't give that to you. Okay, so um, verse four, those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They are mighty who would destroy me. Uh, being my enemies wrongfully, though I've stolen nothing, I still must restore it. What's going on here? So there's several things that are happening here. Um, obviously, there's people that are persecuting David um, without reason, without good cause, and they're powerful people that are doing this, okay? And there's a lot of them. <laughs> and think about, you read, you know, First and Second Samuel, you read how David was just constantly being betrayed, constantly being given up. You know, he, would, he and his men would go hide in one place from Saul, and the people in that area would, would go and t tell Saul, we, look, we David's here, because they wanted to curry favor with the king. Um, David's here, come and, come and get him. You can, if, you're, if you want to kill him, you can come get him here. And this was constantly happening. People were, you know, constantly, um, you know, attacking him from, on all sides, okay? And he knew he was, in, he was right with the Lord, you know, in, in, in his calling and what he was doing. Okay, now he's going to go on to recognize that his, his iniquity as well. Okay, but he knew that it was without cause that these people were attempting to destroy him because he was following what the Lord was telling him to do. He was seeking the Lord. He was asking the Lord, shall I go up, Lord? Shall I go against these people? Shall I go against, shall I do this? David was constantly inquiring of the Lord. Okay, that's how he had a heart after Jesus' heart. That's how he's a type of Christ. Because he didn't do anything without asking, except for a couple of times when he did, and the disaster, of course, that followed from that, okay? So he knew he had to be fed hand to mouth from the Father in heaven. We need to be fed hand to mouth from Jesus in every day, asking him. And this is why, guys, I mean, I just feel in this season, it's, we have to be, I was preaching about this last, or a couple of weeks ago, about this radical you know, rejection of self-dependency and radical, you know, God dependency, being radically dependent upon God. And in this season, it's so important that we are. And so I am I was asking the Lord, I don't know what to put yesterday for the schedule. I was like, what am I going to put? And I just felt the Lord saying, just let's just deal with tomorrow first. Okay. I'm like, okay, Lord. Because I just believe he wants to be, he just wants to be us to be so radically in tune with him and saying, Lord, shall I do this? Shall I do that? Um, and, and so we're going to take it one day at a time. You know, I, I have, you know, there's things I have scheduled with my work and stuff like that, which means you know, there are some restrictions. Um, but, um, you know, so roughly speaking, you know, we'll aim to be in the Hope Center on Tuesdays and Fridays. Um, but I'm going to sort of, you know, I'm going to, I'm not going to be, putting that in stone. It's, going to, it's just going to be week to week because we don't know what's going to happen and what's going on in the world and all that stuff. And so if ever before, you know, there was a time to say, you know, as James says, you know, don't say I will do this and tomorrow I will do that. Next week I might do that, but say, Lord willing. You know? And so it's going to be very much a tentative time. Um, but this is the great thing about following the Spirit of the Lord. You don't know where you're going. You don't, you don't know where, you know, you're coming from. You don't know where you're going. Just like the, when you fall the wind of the Spirit, you know, and, and, and it's like the wind because people don't know where it's coming from, where it's going. But they know when it's there. <laughs> and that's what I think we're going to be like. And, 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 you know, I think that will, that will allow him maximal control. We were singing that song, Heaven's Rule. That will allow Heaven's Rule to be in this ministry, I believe. Um, and so that's what we're going to be doing. Um, and, and so that's what David did. And so that's, I encourage all of us to be like that, not just in the ministry, but in all that we do in this life. There are some things we know, what responsibilities we have, we have to do, and we know what days those are going to be. But even that could change. So, um, and, the, and what I was going to say, the great thing about being, there's this radical uncertainty in following Jesus, in allowing the Holy Spirit, the, following the wind of the Holy Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to blow as he will. There's this radical uncertainty, but the uncertainty is an external thing. Uncertainty. It's, an ex, it's an uncertainty in what in, in, in the external things of the world, but it's absolute rock, solid certainty 
And that whatever God's going to do, it's going to be mighty and good if we are following him, if we are faithful to him, if we are, are blowing with the wind of the Spirit. It's absolute rock song certainty that the outcome is going to be mighty and it's going to be of God. Um, and so it's a beautiful place uh, to be in. And, and I encourage us all to, to get into that place. But it takes... It takes work. It takes work. It takes diligence. And, um, you know, especially at a time when there's just so many cares of the world, it takes really, you know, ruthless, like, prioritization <laughs> of the things of God. And this is something that I'm <clears throat> asking the Lord to help me with um, because th there's just so many things that are vying for my attention. <laughs> Um, and I just have to be, you know, I have to prioritize those in the right way. Um, okay, good. So, um, though I've stolen, they are mighty who would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully, though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore. That's speaking of, okay, you know, it's like the enemy demanding something of you that you don't owe. Okay. And this is a very important principle. Okay. Um, and remember, of course, David's talking about people, his enemies, okay? Um, and, and in some cases, if that applies to us as well in terms of those who hate us and revile us, you know, because we're of Christ and not of the world, um, and because we're speaking the truth of God and, and, and not the, the, the deception, deceptive voice of the world. So that's always going to be, you know, a possibility. But again, you know, we need to understand that there's a spiritual host of wickedness behind all of these things. Christ specifically says to us, bless your enemies, do not curse them. Okay, <laughs> don't, you know, bless them when they revile, revile you and treat you spitefully. Um, and and, and that this is a mighty, mighty, you know, teaching of Jesus, you know, and obviously David did not have the fullness of all of this. But the point is that we can read these Psalms understanding that we could be speaking about our spiritual enemies, those hosts of wickedness. Okay, whether they're involved, they're, 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 they're coming at us through stirring up people or whether they're coming at us in other kinds of more direct ways. Okay, and so here's the thing. The enemy wants you to think that because even though you've stolen nothing, you must restore. He wants you to think that you owe him when you don't. Okay, and this is very, very important for us to, to, to recognize when the enemy tries to do this because here's the thing. Yes, the enemy is a legalist, and yes, the enemy can have legal ground in my life if I partnered with him, okay? But the moment that I break that partnership, and I plead the blood of Jesus over me, and I cry out, you know, in repentance and for forgiveness, and I say, I reject that way, I turn away from that darkness, Lord, I turn back to you, I receive my cleansing by the blood of Jesus, okay? The moment we do that, that legal ground of iniquity is canceled. You see, Jesus is the Redeemer. He is the Redeemer. And He has redeemed everything that I owe. And so I have to apply that. It can't just like, you know, pretend it's always there and then go around having partnerships with the enemy. But when I apply it, okay, then Jesus restores everything. He restores it all. He redeems it all. I do not owe anymore. Okay, because Jesus paid. Okay, Jesus is the restore on my behalf. So I do not owe the enemy anything. We need to tell the enemy this, okay? <laughs> because he hates to hear it and it causes you to flee. That's what it is to resist the devil and he will flee from you, okay? <laughs> Remember that passage in James? I don't know why James keeps coming to me. But in that passage of James, he says, humble yourselves, you know, um, and, 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 you know, repent and weep and, and draw near to God through that. You're drawing near to him as, you, as we do these things that we've been talking about, okay? Coming to him in this, this place of neediness and contrition and brokenness. And then it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That resistance is telling that he has no strings on you, that he has no authority to do these things, okay? And he has to, he has to.
He's been made a public, a public spectacle of. 2,000 years ago, Jesus did it. It's done and dusted. Okay? He has to. Um, and he needs to be told that. But that is what this is speaking about. That is what these enemies do. That is what the enemy does. He demands that I restore something, even if I'm not guilty for it. And you do not have to restore what you are no longer guilty for because you're covered by the blood of Jesus. For that then. Verse 5, oh God, you know my foolishness and my sins are not in from me. See, David's being real. He's saying these people hate me without a cause. Okay, and again, that's a type of Christ just because Jesus was hated without a cause. Um, but he's a human being and he's recognizing his father, his, his, his um, you know, his foibles and his, and his, his iniquities. Okay, and so he's being real with the Lord. He, he can recognize that he's walking with the Lord now, but he knows that the, the sins that have come up in his life, and he utterly hates them, okay? So you, oh God, you know my foolishness, and my sins are not hidden from you. But let not those who wait for you, okay, again, remember those who are trusting in faith in you. Let not those who wait for you, oh Lord God of hosts, be dishonored because of me. Some translations might say be ashamed. But the thought is, it's not like, it's like, it's this idea that we, we bring dishonor upon the church because of our sin. And it is the, one of the worst ramifications of sin. You know, think about a, a, you know, a church leader, you know, like, like who's, who's known really well, a big, big church leader, and, and who falls and has some great area of sin. And it's like, even though that person, you know, can, can be restored, obviously, to the Lord, the, you know, when that person, you know, is, is contrite and broken and repents, I mean, obviously, that person is restored to the Lord. And, 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 and you know, that person could be completely 100% right with the Lord, but the damage that's done, the damage that's done to the church, the people are dishonored because of that church. And it's something, it's, it, it, it's a horrible, horrible, horrible thing because, you know, a person, because of the power of the blood of Jesus, can be restored quite quickly. But that, that brokenness and, 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 and dishonor and, and, and grief and hurt that happens to the body because of it, because the world says, ha ha, look, there you are, you Christians. Yeah, you, you, you're, such, you're such hypocrites, you know. It's such, it's such woundedness to the body of Christ. And many of you guys will know what I'm talking about. You will know of church leaders who have fallen in, in this way. And even though we know that those people are still precious to God and are restored, you know, it's the damage that's done. And I was thinking about um, when, you don't have to turn there, but this is something that speaks of this is in Second. Samuel, when David has, speaking of David's iniquities, when David, you know, um, murders, you know, or, or commits adultery with um, Bathsheba and then murders Uriah the Hittite to try and, um, you know, cover it up. Um, and Nathan, you know, calls him out on this. The prophet Nathan calls him out. And then um, uh, he says this, um, he, David repents. And then Nathan says this to them, the Lord has put, has put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also is, who is born to you shall surely die. And this is the thing, guys. This is the, 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 the wages of sin of death. And even, you know, that death, you know, is something that comes, you know, even when we are forgiven, you know, because, you know, God restores and resurrects and all that stuff. But we have to understand that there are implications of sin, okay, that are born, that are intrinsic to the sin, that aren't necessarily God coming and, and, and saying, okay, because you did that, I'm going to punish you with this. There are implications, guys. That there are wages of sin. And so this is saying, David, you're forgiven, okay? You will, you will not die. God has put away your sin. He's seen your contrition, okay? He's put it away. But because... You've given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Death is to come. Okay. So 
This is what happens in those cases, guys, when a church leader falls, because it gives great occasion for the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme and say, ha, ah, you Christians, oh, you people, and you think Christ is this, and all this blasphemy, okay? And that death of mourning, you know, ministries die. And, and, and a child in scripture is the symbol of a ministry. <laughs> ministries die because of this. And, you know, I, I, I'm saying this with all humility, guys, because I, I can fall just as I was. And that's why we, you know, people who are church leaders need your prayers because we are targets. And we need protection from the arrows of the enemy. Um, and we need to, to pray for the, the big church leaders that are out there, you know. The ones we think, oh, they, there's, these are powerful. That would never happen to them. Because those are precisely the ones that will happen to or could happen to. Um, if, if, if a network of protection isn't there. Um, because the enemy knows he is a slippery, you know, sneaky bugger. Um, is that a bad word? Sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I think we use that word differently. In America, but anyway. Um, <laughs> So forgive me if that was an offense. Um, so anyway, guys, um, this is really, really important. We need to understand this. We need to understand this, guys. And, and we, we need to, um, to, 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 to recognize, you know, constantly allow in our own lives the, 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 the piercing light of the Holy Spirit to show if we're starting to, to go astray somewhere. Um, and that happens through constantly humbling ourselves in the way that David is doing here um and um we so not want this to happen let not verse six those who wait for you O lord god of hosts be dishonored because of it. um because um for your sake i have borne reproach shame has covered my face okay so in other words if we are going to suffer we want it to be for his sake and for his glory and for his purposes not because of our own sin and bringing it upon ourselves and dishonoring the people of the living God, dishonoring the name of the Lord, okay? Um, and we need prayer for protection for that to be the case. But you know what, guys? If it's, if it's, if, if, this, if the, the trial is coming simply for his name's sake, okay, then count it all joy. Count it all joy <laughs> when you suffer various trials. For his name's sake, guys. That's powerful. Um, and so shame has covered my face. Verse 8, I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. How many of you know something about this? Okay. When we choose to follow the Lord, when we choose this radical dependency upon God, when we choose to run with the vision, when we choose to... to to follow the wind of the spirit, all these things, guys, when we do this, it brings a sword. Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Okay, and obviously what he meant by that was, <laughs> was, was, was not that he isn't the Prince of Peace and that um, he gives us his perfect peace, no matter what the situation. Um, what he meant in that context was, I didn't come, to necessarily make everyone, you know, um, b b you know, follow the Holy Spirit and, and, and be on, in unity with me, because that's up to them, okay? And so when I come into your life in a radical way, and my spirit comes into your life in a radical way, and my spirit is allowed to do what he wants to do in your life, um, people are going to like you. And, and there's going to be people very close to you who are going to like you. It's going to bring a sword. It's going to bring division. Um, and it even says, you know, it gets as bad as in, in Matthew 24, when Jesus is talking specifically about the end times and the run up and the, and the birth banks, he says that, um, you know, you, you know, mother will turn against daughter and daughter will turn against mother and father will turn against son and so forth and so on. And, and, and brother will give up brother to be executed and, and all these things. It's like, it's intense swords coming in to relationships okay but 
why does why else that's why jesus says you can't be my disciple unless all those relationships are like hatred in comparison to your relationship in other words we cannot value a human relationship we cannot prioritize it or value it more or more greatly than we do our relationship with him because if we do that we will attempt to save the relationship with the with the person okay and bruise or hinder or, or bring a sword of division between our relationship with jesus okay and then we'll be we will not be of use to him okay in the way that he wants us to be if we choose him okay he will bring around that other relationship okay if we put him first okay trust him okay trust him on that score because <clears throat> If you cry out to him and claim that person's, you know, for him, you know, he will bring that around. Okay. But it's not your job to make, make peace with everyone at the expense of your peace with Jesus, your relationship with him, your obedience to him, your abiding in him, your walking with him. Okay. That's got to be first. And if that is an offense to your brother, mother to your spouse if that is an offense then it's an offense okay but it's so much more important that that you know that we be you know in tune and, and in line with jesus and and again not giving offense needlessly but there are those offenses which must come jesus says okay <laughs> some offenses must come and, and so um and we just be forewarned before it happens. And I'm sure some of you, many of you know this already. Um, and it's not to say you wash your hands of that relationship or that you, you give up loving and praying for that person. Absolutely not a bit of it, no way. But it's to say that um, don't in the flesh try and rescue that relationship at the expense of your, your spiritual walk, okay? Um, we make ourselves, we put, you know, Jesus' name on things and we say, well, Jesus says, you know, we, you know, we, we all need to be you know, unified, so I'm going to make this happen, okay? There are some things we can't make happen because of people's choices. They have free choice, okay? And we don't want to make the, that happen if it's at the expense of being true to the Spirit or the God. Um, okay, how are we doing on time? About 22 okay, good, good, okay. So, um, what verse? Um, verse 7? Verse 8, verse 8, just in verse 8, okay. So, obviously, again, he's speaking about, you know, because um, he's bearing the, the reproach, for the sake of the Lord, he's bearing the reproach, this is even, he's become a stranger to his own family, his brothers. Um, and he says, because, verse 9, Zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. And do we know what that's referring to? Of course, that's a, a prophetic scripture about Jesus um, that the disciples um, recall to mind when Jesus zealously cleansed the temple. <laughs> and it's just so powerful, guys, because he has that same righteous anger and indignation against the enemy's presence in you. And me, because we are temples, as he did for his father's house. You are his father's house as well. I am his father's. And zeal, he is zealous to cleanse this, okay? But he has to have our permission. <laughs> he has to have our permission. Um, and because he's so gracious and merciful, um, he brings us, if we're not giving him permission to do this, whether because we've just become numb to it or, or, or blinded to, to whatever is going on or, or because we're just disobedient to be either one, um, he will bring things around <laughs> that bring us to a place where we're like, oh, yeah, I think I will give you permission to do that, Lord. Um, and Sue said around a powerful testimony today about exactly that thing um, uh, in, in her own life. And, it can, and it, this can be true of all of us guys um we can just be kind of not see something even though we're walking closely with them maybe because it's just something we've we've partnered with for a while and, and we, we go spiritually numb to it just our discernment is off um and um, only the lord can show us and, and he can only do it in his way <laughs> and so um 
we have to, you know, allow him to do that. And how good he is the moment that we, 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 we see it and, and we, we acknowledge and, and, and bam, <laughs> the power of the blood just whoo, deals with it. Um, and that's who he is. That's what he does. Um, so um, he's zealous to cleanse this temple. Okay. But he also wants us to be like David and like him. He wants us to be zealous. He wants us to have this zeal, to be eaten up with zeal for his house. And David is saying, because of that, that's why I am reviled. That's why I am reproached. That's why my family reject me. And there's, there's this division between me and my closest relationships. It's because zeal for hit my father's house has eaten me up, okay? Guys, never, ever, ever for the sake of, you know, confrontation or, 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 or you know, drama or whatever, never, ever, you know, desire this kind of, you know, division to come. I'm not saying you ever would, but I just mean, you know, there are those who can just be kind of like in, instinctively, Kind of naturally in the flesh, you know, confrontational with people and constantly falling out with people and all that sort of stuff. That's that's not of the Lord. But but by the same token, if your zeal for the ways of the Lord and His Spirit, all these things we've been talking about, following His Spirit, if your zeal for that is eating you up, then let the chips fall. Let the chips fall where they may, guys, because you can't be responsible for everybody's choices with respect to how they're going to receive these things um and let it's much more important for that zeal for the lord's house to, to eat you up <laughs> um and, and you'll be in a place sometimes guys when you'll just be like i just lord uh, you know I, uh, it's uncomfortable you'll be in a place of un discomfort because because you know your obedience to him is is causing problems in your relationship, um, in your relationships, and just let his his zeal have its way in you. Okay, and trust in him, but don't um, you know quench that zeal in order to to try and patch up um, those relationships. Uh, the Lord will show you. He'll show you guys as only he can. Um, it's like when Paul said, um, woe is me if I do not preach, okay? Um, you, you'll be in a place where although you'd so much rather just patch everything up, you know, in, in a way, in, in, a, in a human kind of way, the, the, the zeal will compel you and woe is you if you don't do as, the, as that zealousness for the Lord's house um, is, is, is urging you to do. Um, Okay, um, and the reproaches, the second part of that verse, first line was, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Okay, and that's the way it works. <laughs> I'm thinking of, um, when I was reading this earlier today, I thought of that passage where Jesus says, if the world hated you first, um, they're going to hate, um, if they hated me first, they're going to hate you too. It's in John chapter 15, I know, just looked it up quickly before we um, started but you don't have to turn there now but you can if you want it's John chapter 15 from verse 18 if the world hates you you know that it hated me before it hated you if you were of the world the world would love its own yet because you were not of the world but I chose you out of the world therefore the world hates you remember the word that I said to you a servant is not greater than his master if they persecuted me they will also persecute you you, if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Okay? It works both ways, thankfully. <laughs> but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. It's the way it is, guys. And there are some who will turn and they will hear your word, okay? And they will follow your word, the word that, you know, that Christ puts in you. The word that he gives you from his word, from his spirit, they will follow it, okay? And there are those who will hate and despise and revile you for you speaking the truth because they are of the world and they do not want to see the light of Jesus. They do not want to.
to turn towards. But what's that? That's nothing to do with you. That's nothing to do. You know, you just, we have to see this principle that the, the reproach, that reproach for the Lord. What did Samuel, um, what did God say to Samuel when the people demanded a king? They said, God said to Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Okay. They said to, they said to Samuel, no, we want a king like the nations of, around us have. We want to do it the world's way. Okay. So give us a king the way the world does it. And God said, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me and my ways. Okay. So the world rejects the ways of the Lord, the ways of the Spirit. They do it the way of the world. And they're going to hate you. <laughs> and me, if we declare the Lord's ways, okay? Um, but there are some, there are some who will hear and who will turn and who will receive the light of Jesus because you speak the word, okay? They will hear, they will follow your word, as Jesus says. But those reproaches fall on you, okay? Because you're Jesus's man or woman. <laughs> because you're declaring the spirit of truth, and it's a reproach for the Lord, that it will fall on you and me. Um, verse 10, when I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that became my reproach. I also made sackcloth my garment. I became a byword to them. Those who sit in the gate speak against me, and I am the song of the drunkards. Okay, so as if it's not bad enough that, you know, that he's, Receiving, you know, he's for him following the Lord and and and, and um, representing the Lord. You know, these reproaches are falling on him. But furthermore, his own like spiritual, you know, uh, godlike, godly response um, to these things. That is his, you know, his open, you know, uh, repentance by by um, you know fasting and. and um, and wearing sackcloth and that sort of thing is open, you know, um, you know, he humbled himself, humbling himself for all the world to see. That is, is even added to his reproach, okay, the reproach that they have for him. Um, and it will be the same with us, guys. But we need still to be doing it. We need still to be humbling ourselves, abasing ourselves. Um, and we will be reproached and reviled. For that as well, but that's okay. Um, that's the place of power. That's the place of abiding. Um, and it says, those who sit in the gates speak against me, that, spe that speaks of judges. Those who, you know, those who, you know, are, are the authorities, um, you know, they're judging me. They're speaking against me. Okay, everybody is against him. All the, 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 the authorities of the world, you know, are against him. Verse 13, but as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of your mercy. Hear me in the truth of your salvation. What, what more do we need, guys? Do you see how David always brings it back? Well, the Spirit speaking through David always brings it back to the truth about who God is and what he does. Even though David is in this place of pouring his heart out of, of repentance, of of humbling himself, of crying out, this place of, you know, in the miry clay and in, in the pit, okay? He goes on to declare who God is. My prayer is to you in the acceptable time. And this is what I was saying about before, guys. Because we have the blood of Jesus and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is always the acceptable time. This is the acceptable year of the Lord. This is it because he's come, okay? Because he, we live in a world in which Jesus died for us. He shed his blood for us and destroyed and dethroned every principality. And we live in a world where the Holy Spirit's been poured out upon his church. This is the acceptable time. The only thing that determines whether we have the response that, that David is, is declaring here is whether our hearts are right. That's, that's it. It's whether we have humbled ourselves. And, 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 and we come with broken spirits and contrite hearts. Then every time is acceptable. And in the multitude of his mercy, he hears us in the truth of his salvation. <laughs> because he saved us and he's done it all. And again, that wasn't true for David at that time. 
but David speaking prophetically about what's true for us. Thank you, Lord. Um, we're, we're a little bit over. I'm just going to do two more verses and we'll stop. So deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink, verse 14. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. You see, it started, the first part of the psalm started with the deep waters washing over him. Then it went through this time of, of, of declaring what the enemies were doing, but of humbling himself, of, 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 of acknowledging his own sin, of, of crying out to protect him from you know, temptation and, and, and bringing d- dishonor upon his people, the people of God. A time of just you know, humbling himself and crying out from this place. And then he brings it right back to those waters and he says, Now, Lord, rescue me from this place. Such a beautiful, beautiful, powerful, powerful, spirit-filled prayer, guys. You could pray 1 through 15, guys, over yourself whenever you're in this same place. And you will come out of those waters by the, by the hand and power of Jesus. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not, verse 15, the flood water overflow me, nor let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut its mouth on me. In other words, he feels like he's in the grave, but he's not going to stay there. The Lord's going to pull him out of that place of death, okay? And by his resurrection power, he will pull you out as well. As James says in that passage I was talking about, when we, you know, when we humble ourselves and we we abase ourselves, he in due time will exalt us. He will lift us up on that broad plateau of peace besides still waters and in those um, uh, green pastures. Praise the Lord. That's who he is and that's what he does. So guys, wherever you are right now, wherever you may be in the season to come, the season of birth pains, that's the season we've entered, guys. This is the beginning and there's going to be more birth pangs. Um, and the next season after that is the tribulation. And I believe we're going to be gone for that season. <laughs> But we need to be so preparing the way for him so that when we are taken away, we have prepared the earth, okay? Prepared the earth for what is to come. And by that, what I mean is prepared the world to receive Jesus. You see, because they're going to, many of them are going to click once we are taken away. So we need to be preparing the way for that so that his church will you know his his church that is you know formed and and this includes that the the jewish people are going to be powerfully leading the revival through the tribulation okay the great tribulation and um you know we need to be preparing the world for that that is our church okay and for christ's eventual return when we come back to, 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 to wage war with him on, on the Antichrist and to seek to establish his kingdom and righteousness and, and to rule and reign with him. Okay? We need to be preparing the way. And so this is a season when we need to be, these things are going, we're going to be going through these things. Jesus said, and we're going to be going through them, not in like the way maybe we kind of read these verses in the past, like, oh, you know, the, my, my work colleague, you know, making fun of me. and Because that's how we think normally. We don't because we just, life has been so easy and good for the most part. Things are changing. Life is still going to be amazing. It's going to be an adventure, it's, but it's going to be tumultuous. And um, there's going to be these things and they're going to be intense. But when they come, remember, remember, guys, this Bible study. Remember what you can do. Remember who he is. Remember that he will give himself. Okay. And remember that a servant has to be like his master. Okay. <laughs> if it happened to him, it'll happen to us. But that's okay. Eternal weight of glory. So out- outweighed. Let's pray, guys. I thank you, Lord, for your holy word, your awesome truths, Lord. I thank you for the strength they bring to us, Lord. I thank you for your spirit, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for Pentecost. I thank you for your blood, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that we live 
under this amazing dispensation, Lord, where we have Pentecostal power, Pentecostal outpouring, where we have the blood of Jesus, Lord, which conquers every disease and washes every sin and restores every heart, Lord, for those who are willing, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, that you've appointed us to this season, to this time. And though it's a trial, a time of trial, Lord, you will lead us out of it. You will lead us through it. You will be with us. We shall fear no evil because of your perfect love poured out upon us, Lord, as we abide in you in this season, in this time, as we run with the vision, Lord, as we wait upon you, Lord, trusting in faith, Lord that you will accomplish all that you said you would. Thank you, Jesus, for all these things, Lord. Help us, stir us up, give us steadfast endurance, I pray, Lord. Oh, let us be eaten up with zeal for your house, whatever the consequences, Lord. Let us burn our bridges, Lord. Let us burn our bridges, if those bridges would lead us back to a place of less abiding, less following the wind of the Spirit, less zealousness, less zeal for your house, Lord. Let us burn those branches and move onward and upward in this mighty call that you've called us to. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise